My name is Dennis DeAnda. I am the Chief of Law Enforcement Unit within the Office of Spill Prevention and Response, which is a subset of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We're here today to discuss the Operation Support Center. First of all, is the Operation Support Center used to be you know, referred to by one of two other names, either the Department Operations Center or the Emergency Operations Center. The Operation Support Center, which is the new title for the facility, better reflects its mission and purpose within the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. The office is located at 1700 K Street, Suite 250 on the second floor in Sacramento, and it's a rather large room where uh, employees within the office, the office of Spill Prevention and Response will uh, gather to provide support to a spill or incident command somewhere in the state. Though co-located with OSPER headquarters staff, the operations center is a separate facility with a secure entrance. The operations center is a large room with stations in the various emergency response functional roles arranged in a circle around the operations center chief in the middle. When the operations center is activated for a drill or an incident, Three trained staff members move from their desks to assigned locations in the Operations Center. The Operations Support Center houses all of the general functions an incident command would normally, would normally hold, with the exception of the fact that they make absolutely no decisions with regard to the incident. So in the Operations Support Center you would have a Operations Chief or Deputy Operations Chief you would have uh, a person responsible for liaison, a public information officer, uh, planning officers, um, legal, as well as finance. So all of these people would act in support of an incident somewhere in the state where we would already have a state on-scene coordinator working with more than likely a federal on-scene coordinator at a spill or other event where OSPR would be partaking in the activities. The Operations Support Center has several functions, and the primary function is to act in support of the incident command and incident commander at whatever spill we would be at. In addition to that, the Operations Support Center will maintain communication with the governor's office and will maintain liaison with the federal, state, and local governmental partners in a response as well as NGOs. The Operations Support Center does not make decisions for the the operation in the field that is solely the responsibility of the incident commander. In addition to that, the Operations Support Center will maintain documentation of all decisions and activities that occur. They will also maintain reports and actually develop reports and provide communication outside of the Office of Spill Prevention Response to the director as well as to other agencies. The Operations Support Center will only be opened as long as it's needed and its hours of operation, generally speaking, are at the request of the incident commander on, this, on the incident for which we are supporting it. Uh, generally, the Operations Support Center will be closed down during uh, late hours because it normally will mimic whatever response activities occur in the field. The Operations Support Center will actually be staffed based on the type of incident that occurs and in the last several months, the Office of Spill Prevention and Response has been drilling to open this center more frequently. So during a spill of any significance where we believe that support to an incident command is needed, we will open the Operation Support Center uh, immediately. Uh, how that happens is going to be a little bit different depending on the situations that we would actually operate in, but generally speaking, most branch chiefs within the Office of Spill Prevention and Response are on a rotational schedule to be available to open the center and make notification to the rest of OSPR uh, that the center is open and uh, to establish assignments to get people into the center. Uh, generally speaking, the operations duty officer will be integral in dealing with making notification and notifying those people responsible for opening the operations center. 
So generally speaking, during normal hours, the notification will normally be uh, established through the spill desk. Spill desk will notify either myself or one of the other branch chiefs within the office, and we will initiate the operations support center opening at that time. After hours, it'll be a little different. The operations duty officer will generally make notification to the incident commander and to the branch chief who has the rotation to be available to open the op center during off hours. And then they will work together in concert to get out the information to the rest of the Office of Spill Prevention Response, either through Twitter or through an emergency broadcast or the EBS, which we have established uh, with all of our smartphones. In the establishment of a greater use of the Operations Support Center, the Drills and Exercises Unit within the Office of Spill Prevention Response has, has actually published a Operations Support Center job aid that is available on the department server and can be used to help um, anyone who is going to be operating within the Operations Support Center with their specific role. It uh, has a checklist, it has phone numbers of those branch chiefs who have responsibilities to be able to open the op center when it needs to be operated, um, as well as other supporting information with regard to uh, the roles and and duties of each individual at each station. Uh, it's important to realize too that the Operations Support Center may also be used as an incident command post in rare occasions where we need to establish a centralized uh, incident command. Uh, that could be for any number of reasons. Uh, the latest, the latest, or the last time the Operations Support Center was actually used in that regard was during the tsunamis during 2011 where we did not have any active spills per se, but we had large amounts of responses up and down the coast trying to determine if we did in fact have problems. And it was the best way to organize our efforts in our response to meet our mission and goals. So with that, um, you're gonna see a number of other people who actually will staff the positions here at the Operations Support Center. They'll tell you what their roles and duties are, and uh, hopefully this will be an informative training aid to everyone here in the office. I'm Alexia Retallick and I am one of the Public Information Officers for the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. During an emergency under the State Oil Spill Contingency Plan, I would come into the Emergency Operations Center as an initial information officer. An initial information officer provides support to the PIOs who are deploying, running to the field and taking care of uh, getting a joint information center set up and gathering initial information. During that time between arriving on scene and their travel, we provide the support to media who are calling. We initiate the oil spill uh, response websites. We have Cal Spill Watch. We have Cal Spill Watch Facebook and the Twitter page. We would initiate the first tweets. We would make contact with the other public information officers from the other responding agencies and start the coordination there. We also are the point of contact for the resource agency press secretary if they have questions or want to provide us information. We continue to monitor social media, uh, regular media, and any of the blogs and Twitter feeds out there and provide that information to the information officers on scene. If there is a fishery closure, that function is actually handled out of Fish and Game headquarters here at OSPER, and we would support putting a press release and those materials together, coordinating with the Joint Information Center on scene. Um, we continue to provide those support roles, research roles, social media monitoring, and any other support that the Joint Information Center feels necessary until such time that the incident commander or the Joint Information Center feels that we can demobilize. Hi, I'm Joy Lavin Jones, and I'm uh, one of the people that uh, would be performing the role of Operations Center Liaison Officer. And the primary job is to support the Command Post Liaison Officer. Their, their job is a primary point of contact and conduit of information between the response and government agencies. So they're getting requests from the response to make contacts, to get information, but they're also getting requests from 
government agencies for information as well. So it can be a very busy job at the command post. It can be very hectic. So my job here is to alleviate some of that, to try and make some of those contacts, to try and get the information out. Um, that's one of the jobs. Another important job here is we develop a group-wise list of contacts of agency representatives at the local, state, and federal levels. And this includes state and federal legislators. So we put together the list, we send that initial notification of the spill, and then we also send periodic updates. And this isn't to replace press releases or the Cal Spill website. We try and complement that. So we provide information in a little different format that's more meaningful perhaps, a little more detailed to government agencies. As an example, a lot of them are involved in the area contingency planning process, so we might provide information about ACP sites and strategies and that kind of thing. I think another important thing is we provide them a point of contact here. There's always a phone number and an email address so they can contact a real live person. So again, they're not having to go to the command post and get that information. Um, and I think that's it. That's the primary role. Support the command post liaison and generate updates to uh, local government, state, local, federal government agencies, uh, just to keep them informed. If, if they're getting information, then if their questions are being answered, then the focus isn't on what are you keeping from us, the focus is on the response, and that's where it should be. So that's my primary job. Thank you. The the function of uh, an attorney in the Ops Center is to uh, essentially provide uh, support, support to headquarters staff, um, unique issues that come from headquarters, and to act as a liaison with folks in the field. Uh, the attorney function is recognized as a technical specialist in the incident command system, so that's how we plug in, um, although we generally provide attorney-client communications to uh, headquarters staff. Um, the government code, the Lemper Keen Sea Strand Act that, that Oscar operates under and the pollution provisions of the Fishing Game Code provide some unique issues that make it important for an attorney to, uh, to monitor and handle. Um, probably an attorney will roll to the command post. Um, command posts can be tight quarters and inconvenient to do research and, and draft documents, so uh, the attorney here at the op center can take some of that burden off of the attorney in the field and, and, and can, can really focus on whatever the task is. Um, it's preferable for an attorney here at the op center to handle questions that come directly from director's office or the resources agency of the governor's office because um, the situation of the command post can be um, quite turbulent um, and, and handling those questions here as I said reduces the, the burden on the attorney in the field because the attorney in the field will be working on very different issues usually. Um, so some of the issues that might come up are determination of who the RP is and, and what the jurisdiction is funding of cleanup, fisheries closures, issuing cleanup orders, handling third-party claims, uh, liaisoning with the responsible party attorney if there is one, coordinating with local prosecutors if they're involved. Um, and essentially just being available for, for whatever legal issues might come up. My name is Randy E. Mai. I work for the scientific branch and environmental program manager for the response support unit. I typically staff the planning station here behind me. Uh, our typical duties is, uh, again, reiterate this is that we support the, the activities the, before the incident command post has been established, so we support the, the field staff while we're here. Um, we have a, a number of different um, tasks and responsibilities that we provide the field staff, one of which is the, the admin support. So we support our documentation unit by providing availability of staff, um, availability of uh, the different functions that can support the, the scientific unit out in the field. Um, we also try to 
initiate some of the more arduous tasks that, that happen, such as establishing MOAs, so we make those initial contacts with the different federal, state, and local governments to try to initiate MOAs, <coughs> or um, try to identify permits that will be needed, and even coordinate with our own department for, for um, incidental, incidental take permits and also uh, endangered species uh, permits. We also provide scientific support um, before all of our ESs get on scene, so we try to, to initiate some of the critical components before a spill occurs, such as the fisheries closure. What we'd like to do is find out, um, you know, some of the initial information that's gathered during a spill, such as the, the type of product, the amount of product, how much, um, how much is in the water, because that determines whether or not we're going to proceed with the fisheries closure. Um, we always want to make sure that we um, um, protect our workers, and so we will consult with our health and safety personnel um, to ensure that a site safety plan is established, at least an initial site safety plan, so that everybody follows the same rules. Um, we also provide and notify um, our partners at UC Davis, the Oil Wildlife Care Net Network, because it's, it's easier to, to ramp them up and put them on alert or put them on alert than having them start um, um, cold. So we want to be able to provide them as much information as we, as we can. Um, the other type of information that um, we want to start right away is determine whether or not we need to consider dispersant use. So we have our applied response technology person alerted and let them uh, be aware that this may be an issue. And finally, um, we want to make sure that we support the, the operations center here in Sacramento. And so we provide uh, displays, uh, or GIS displays, maps, update the, the stat board here regarding weather, environmental conditions that may occur out in the field. And that's what we do here in the planning station. Hi, my name is Marguerite Diaz, and when I'm deployed to the Operations Center, the Ops Chief and the Deputy Ops Chief are usually here, as well as several of the other functional area staff. So when I come into the Ops Center, I'm usually playing catch-up to ensure that the historical log um, includes information that is pertinent to the incident that had occurred prior to my coming in, as well as me updating that during the entire uh, time I'm in the operations center. My primary duty is to provide administrative support to the operations center chief and the deputy, deputy operations chief, and to coordinate with the field documentation unit to ensure that information is disseminated between the field as well as the Ops Center as needed. At any given time, I could go to any of these other functional areas to answer their telephones in the event that the staff is not here. During my time in the Ops Center, uh, I will be collecting documentation, ensuring that the daily activities reports are collected, making sure everybody signs in and out, coordinating with the OSPR staff to find out what availability there is with the operations staff to be deployed to the field or to help us out in here in the Ops Center. I will work with uh, different functional units to get information for the operations center chief, ensure that all emails are collected, and then coordinate all the documentation and organize into a predetermined set of uh, documents for this incident. In coordination with the documentation unit leader in the field, during demobilization, they also have a predetermined set of documentation that is will be provided to them. And at the end of 
the ops operations center during demobilization, I will coordinate with the documentation unit leader to ensure that we come up with one set of pre-organized documentation um, for the incident. Uh, this can go on throughout the entire response, which can go on way after the operations center is demobilized. So uh, I would be talking to documentation after the incident as well. well. That's pretty much what documentation does. You know, at any given time I could be really busy. It doesn't sound like it's, you know, real busy, but it is a very busy desk because there's a lot of coordination going back and forth between the field and the operations center. Making copies, faxing information, calling people in the in the field as the operations chief requires. And also answering any public uh, inquiries that I can based on the information that I've gotten from the field or from our chief. At different times throughout the operations center functions, I may have to update the board that's behind me as well, depending on uh, whether or not I get, I get more, more up-to-date information or not. My name is Cassandra White and I'm one of the people who works in the logistics section. And for logistics, it can be anything from lodging, food, travel, supplies, all sorts of things. And here in the op center, we're really, it's that initial time of when the first responders, and so my main function usually at that time is setting up um, lodging for them. And to do that, we've been using the um, DFG American Express account, which has been just a vital function because that's one less thing responders have to worry about, which is very important, but it's one less thing they have to worry about, you know, where they're going to sleep. So we do that. Um, set up travel, which could be airfare, rental cars, get that together and sometimes we're asked to locate actual incident command post sites from here. One thing that, and we incorporate the OSPR IT staff, which plays a key role in getting go, uh, the computers and our go kits together that will be going out in the field. And also, oftentimes, they are also deployed at that time in the field. Because under the logistics section, the command, the OSPR command trailer, is deployed and the command trailer has copier machines, fax machines. Uh, we can set up our computer, our LAN network through there. And also, a lot of times it's used to be transportation for other large equipment and other supplies that we need to get to staff who's already been deployed. And again, OSPR IT plays a key role in setting those functions up. Many times, and in the response, the OSPR command trailer has been used as the incident command post, depending on, sometimes it's a remote location, it's small enough, and it's served as the command post. A lot of times here, I coordinate with documentation to make notifications of staff who will be deployed. And the main thing is here, we're capturing everything on a requisition because that's always a key function to capture everything on a requisition. Later on, that will be key for finance when they go back and prepare costs for the incident. And we are here in the op center until logistics in the field is fully operating and they feel like they don't need that support anymore. My name is Becky Mack and I am the finance section chief. The finance section has four units in it. It has the time unit, the cost unit, the procurement unit, and the compensation and claims unit. The first thing you have to do as the finance section chief is determine the funding source of the spill. Is there a responsible party? You have to meet with legal and the incident commander to determine if there is a responsible party and if they've been identified. If they have been identified, one of the first things you do is check their uh, certificate of financial responsibility to see if it's up to date and current and what type of coverage that they have. The second thing you do is meet and confer with the responsible party to determine what are the procurement processes and the processes for hiring contractors and monitoring the contractors. 
that's one of the very first things that has to be done because most of the time the cleanup contractors are who are called out immediately to respond to start the cleanup of the spill. Um, the next thing that you would do if there isn't a responsible party is determine who is going to pay for the cleanup. Will there be federal funds available or the state oil spill trust fund? If there, is, if there are federal funds available, you need, you need to meet with the Coast Guard to set up the uh, federal funding and get approval for the state's expenses for that. The um, next thing you'd want to do is set up the uh, claims unit, which would handle all third-party third claims for any types of damages that are there. You'd have to advertise for claims, and uh, usually it's through a toll-free number, so a 1-800 number has to be established to give that out to anybody who's damaged by the oil spill itself. We also have to make sure that we're tracking all our costs from the very start of the spill and we have to set up a response cost accounting code which for the Department of Fish and Game is a, a PCA code, a pro program cost account code to track all the spill, the spill expenditures so that we can get reimbursed from either the federal fund or whoever the responsible party is. We also work with all state and local government agencies. We are their primary contact to the federal fund or also to the responsible party. And we do that working with the uh, state's liaison officer to give them the information on how to track their costs and to get reimbursed for their costs. The um, finance section also has to manage the daily response ceilings and approvals and manage our budgets and our cost estimates. The incident commander would always want to know a daily cost estimate for what's been spilled and what we're projected, I mean, for what's been spent and what's projected to be spent for the remainder of the spill response. We do also monitor the state's oil spill response trust fund to make sure that there are adequate funds in there to pay for our expenses and prepare analysis and recommendations to the OSPR administrator as well as the incident commander. This concludes our operational center presentation. Here at OSPR, we strive to have a well-prepared, experienced staff ready at a moment's notice to fill their assigned roles when an oil spill and response is necessary. We are committed to providing California with the best achievable protection of coastal and marine resources. This is who we choose to be in the world. Though we would rather prevent oil spills, preventing spills can never be 100%, unfortunately. So when oil does hit the water, the OSPR Operational Center will activate to support our field responders and assist in the protection and restoration of California's natural resources.